This past week in a small group that I teach on Tuesday afternoons as part of the story, uh, I was sharing with uh, our, our folks how difficult it is at times as we've been going through the story to find uh, a sermon that's really all about good news. Uh, it seems that each week it's, it's more the same of, of discouragement, of sin, of failure, of, of trying and, and not making it. And so this week we get to another one of those stories where we find ourselves uh, in the midst of wondering, uh, is there any good news in the midst of this? And, and it's good in this week that we, we discover uh, King Hezekiah. Not only that, we have this glimpse in the story this week of, of what Isaiah is saying that yet still out of all of this, all is not lost because there's one who is coming as we anticipate uh, the birth of Christ. As we pick that up, we get to the New Testament in about four or five weeks. And so where we are in the story, uh, we're sort of in 2 Kings in your Bible uh, where we've reached that place where Israel is in the, is in the north and and uh, Judah in the south, the kingdoms are divided. Because of their sin, the, uh, God's people are no longer unified. We find that these wicked kings have taken over the thrones of both kingdoms, and they continue to lead the people further and further away from God. And because the people are no longer listening to God, God lifts up prophets who go boldly and confront the people and call them to repent, to change, to stop doing what they're doing, these spiritual, spirit-filled prophets inform the people of, of what is it that God wants in their lives and, and how they might change and how they can do things differently. At the same time, they say, if you continue to dis disregard God's word, then indeed there's going to be, I can't look away forever at what you're doing. If the people continue to dis disregard the ways of God, God's going to remove his hand of protection and blessing and allow the forces of this world to overtake them. And so today, as we continue in the story, we see this is exactly what happens. Despite the warnings, despite the pleas of the prophets, God's chosen people have chosen to continue their ways over God's ways. And so God permits, and notice the word permits, the evil uh, king of Assyria to invade the northern kingdom. And what they do, they just take them all away back into their kingdoms, and those ten tribes are absorbed and never heard from again. Many people refer to them as the lost tribes of Israel. And so it is the beginning of the end. Before we go and ask the God who claims to love us and forgive us, to how could God allow this to happen to his chosen people? But they had 208 years to change their ways. 208 years of, of prophets, of those who said, hey, this is where you're going, watch it, you're heading to the cliff and you're going to fall off. There's going to be a point where, where I can no longer call you my own because you don't follow me at all. And so we find that God continue to invite them into that covenant relationship with him. God could not demand it. We know we go back to the beginning of, of, of Adam and Eve, that God gave us that choice. I want you to choose to be in a relationship with me. He gave Adam and Eve that choice, and we've been living with those choices. Yes, we can choose to, to believe in God, and we can choose not to. And so we find the consequences of this becoming so, so horrible but the choice is theirs. And so is the choice ours today as to whether we choose to be in that relation, that we respond to God's grace in our lives. And the choices we make have consequences. Obedience to God's way brings tremendous blessings in our lives. Disobedience brings discipline. This past week, I, I read about a newscast back in 1982 where ABC broadcast uh, a very unusual piece of modern artwork. It was, a, it was on exhibit, it was a simple wooden chair, and across from it was a shotgun that was also sitting on another chair. And so the, the, uh, the artwork said that somewhere uh, the shotgun has been set to go off in the next hundred years or so. 
And so people could come and, and see that artwork, but it was an interesting thing. They said that folks came and wanted to sit in the chair, thinking, okay, for my few seconds in the chair, what's going to be the chance that it could happen to me? They knew the gun could go off at point-blank range, yet it seemed that hundreds of people were willing to gamble that that fatal blast would not happen while they were sitting in the chair. A pastor hearing about this exhibit wrote these pointed words. Most of us are smart enough, smart enough not to sit in that chair. But how many of us spend a life down looking down the barrel of sin, gambling that the gun will not go off any time? soon well in many and various ways god tries to get the people's attention to warn them about traveling down the roads that would bring heartache and pain and hurt in their lives to show them the path that would lead to blessings and peace but the people wouldn't listen to god Instead, they chose to listen to the other voices of the world, voices that were making them question whether or not the God who claimed to be the God Almighty was really the God in charge of their world, or whether they really needed this God in their life, making them question whether this God could really be trusted with the day-to-day -day experience of life, protection of their nation. And guess what? It's the question that that we ponder today as we continue going through this story. Who are you listening to? Whether we realize it or not, there's certain people in our lives that we allow to shape our attitudes, our decisions, our mindset. We think about it, we, all, we can identify very easily that we have all those uh, voices that influence what we buy, how we live our lives, the type of places with the clothes we wear, the, the things that we buy, we can admit that that influences us as much as we don't, we want to deny it at times. We know the, the commercialism of our culture, that voice is always coming, and, and we know the battle, what it is about that influence. But there's also other voices, people that, are, that in our life speak and we listen to their voice. They shape our attitudes. Those voices shape our decisions and our mindset. So who are those people in your life? And the question really is, are they the people that you should be allowing to influence you? Last week, if you recall, I talked about uh, getting a phone call from God. And I have my phone off this week, so uh, there won't be any phone calls coming in. But at the end of the service, I asked you, you know, if God was on your uh, screen as you picked up the phone, would you answer it? And God is calling us. What I didn't say is that there are many other folks who are calling into our lives. Many phone calls from many people who want to influence us, that we have allowed to influence us. And do we take those calls? And yes. And, and do we allow those phone calls to influence us, those relationships? We know that every four years, whoever's the president of the United States pulls together a group of advisors called his cabinet. And we know, looking through ish, history, that the people that the president picks for his cabinet are the people that he is going to listen to. The type of people that are around the president, we can pretty much expect that, that there are going to be the type of policies and, 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 and focuses that that president has. We understand that. And so as the president does that, uh, I'd like us to think about who are the cabinet of people that we have invited into our lives. Who are those people that uh, we have invited in that we choose to sur surround ourselves with? Who are the people that when you have a tough decision to make that you call, you say, hey, I'm really struggling, help me to do that. People who influence our attitudes, our decisions. Do we know who those people are in our life? Do we realize that the influence that some of them have, good or otherwise? Are they the right kind of people to influence you? 
if you're a parent or a grandparent or you have uh, some young people in your lives, you realize uh, what happens when that child gets to that place where they choose to stop listening to who had been the authorities in their life. You know, they stop listening to mom and dad because we don't know anything. I don't know what age it happens for your children, but, uh, you know, it happens in different ages. And then who do they turn to? To all of their other wise 12-year-olds. All those 16-year-olds who really have figured out what life is all about. It doesn't, it can be 22, it can be 42, it doesn't really matter. But you've seen it where you've seen it in other folks. Where, well, he's doing this, she's doing that because that's their best friend. And that's what they like to do. And he or she is a follower rather than a leader. Whatever we say, and we've seen that. It's always easier to see it in somebody else, isn't it? Rather than ourselves at times. I mean, I look back in, those, in my life and, and uh, you know, looking at some of the folks in those vulnerable times of life that you allow them to influence. You know, for me, it was, uh, it was in middle school. You know, there were some kids and it was just going down that path of, because I wanted to fit in. And, and we, we follow people for different reasons along the way. And so along the way, we transfer the authority from whoever it was important in our lives to somebody else. And that's a natural part of growing up where, where you begin to find yourself. But such a transition makes us parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, teachers, pastors, youth leaders, a little bit nervous because we know too well the kind of people that, are, that can really take advantage of the folks that we love. And listening to them can have a, a, a really bad influence on their life or it can have a really good influence on their life. The question is, people influence us. Are we going to choose the best people to do that? During the American Revolutionary War, a letter from the governor of Boston was sent to King George in England. The letter said, if you ask an American who his master is, he will say that he has none, nor governor, but none but Jesus Christ. In other words, the governor of Massachusetts would say that the people that he knew in that, in the, back in those days, they would listen to Jesus Christ. How things have changed. Can we say that about our own lives? No one influences my life but Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is my king. No one governs my life but Jesus Christ. Can we honestly say that? Is that our heart's desire? Is that the, it may not be there, but is that where we want to go? Because when we think about that, if that's the place we, we want to be, then we've got a king to look at today that models that so well for us. King Hezekiah, cannot, we can honestly say, was the only person that was willing to give his ears and his heart an allegiance to the Almighty God. See, there was a candle of light in the midst of this dark time of Israel. Hezekiah became king at the age of 25. How many would you love to be king at age 25? A lot of 25-year-olds think they're king. <laughs> That's the problem. I remember, uh, I mean, I was a pastor of my first church at age 25. They survived uh, that. I didn't quite, but uh, I had to learn a lot. The fact that King Hezekiah was so successful believes when he invited wise people around him. I believe that, that Hezekiah turned to those folks who, who had that influence, and we're going to see, and one of those persons was, was the prophet Isaiah. But I believe he chose to surround himself with a group of God-fearing people who offered him wise wisdom, counsel based on God's word. 